Uh, well, th thank you for attending tonight. I'm absolutely overjoyed. Um, most of my classes are not this full, and <laughs> most, of, most of you aren't asleep already. Um, I, 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 um, I have a lot of things I'd like to share with you today. Um, we're really going to be dealing about the oceans, and we're going to talk about the Gulf um, oil spill, obviously. But the, the reality is I want us to think about not just the Gulf oil spill, but our relationship between the news, our relationship between our, the ocean, um, not just about where the oil goes, OK? So um, I, we have high amounts of yellow here, so don't think you're getting some sort of eye infection. Uh, <laughs> this is the best, best we can do right now. You'll see, first of all, that um, I have a, a job at the university that spans both biology and the School of Medicine and Dentistry. And I'm an oceanographer. Okay, so right now my credibility is shot as far as you're probably concerned. So let me try to justify that a little bit. Um, the University of Western Ontario, about 10 years ago, had this vision. Well, maybe a little longer than 10 years ago. But the, the medical school had this vision that they could treat patients that were influenced by a negative or a poor environment until, you know, they can constantly be constantly treating these patients. Or they could have somebody come in and talk about the environment. If we repair the environment, maybe the stresses on the community, the health aspects of the community will um, be improved. So through two major funding organizations, the Ivy family and the McConnell family, they endowed some money to have someone come to the medical school and talk about the environment and health. And I do that part-time, and I do the biology part-time, and so I'm actually not very good at doing either of the two things because <laughs> I do run out of time. But um, I will admit, um, I love the ocean. Uh, oh, and you probably have a kind of a similar feel for the ocean as well. There's a smell, there's a salt, there's um, you know, all the aspects of the ocean that make us flock there in the wintertime. It's not just the cool temperatures here. It's, of course, where you're going. It smells good. It's soothing. We get our resources from them, an enormous amount of resources right now. We depend on the oceans for many things. And, of course, uh, as, you, as you heard, I'm a Manitoban. So like every good Canadian, from Manitoba, every young boy from Manitoba, I desired to get out of the wheat fields and study the oceans. The oceans had a mystery to me. They were poorly studied by the time, well, when I started to go to grad school. And, and you can tell from my, my haircut, that was some time ago. But, um, the reality is, I went to be an oceanographer because there, there were so many mysteries to solve. There are places we've never been, microbes we've never seen, organisms we've never, ever talked about. And in the evolution of becoming an oceanographer, something changed. Our relationship with the ocean changed. It, 25 years ago, 30 years ago, it was still a great unknown. Still is, but the human influence on the ocean has started to overpower our ability to look at the great unknown. It's hard to look at the ocean now and not see the imprint the, 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 or the footprints of humans. So here's some examples, not too surprising. You know, the oceans are the final repository of almost all our activities in land. Plastics all end up in the ocean floating on the surface, having a wide variety of consequences. On the right-hand side, there's a, a relationship between our cities and our wastes, where our cities are located, not on the, well, on the ocean, not just for transport, but because that ocean provides a great way to get rid of our waste. Industrial waste, um, you know, um, domestic waste, it's right there. Now, I don't know if any of you are from Victoria, but Victoria is notorious for this. Um, 
Basically, Victoria says, when you flush the toilet, we don't want anything to do with it. Nature will solve it, because we're on the ocean. And it goes through a period, series of pipes and then out to the ocean, and they hope that the ocean will take it away and away. And I talked to a class this morning and reminded them Boston was the same thing. There's some treatment plants, but basically, waste goes out 30 kilometers, and then it floats to the surface, and then the winds bring it back to Boston. <laughs> okay? All right? Didn't work very well. So the class today was a sustainability class, so I thought, okay, you know, how do you solve this problem? Well, you could solve it by putting, making, instead of 30 kilometers, let's put it 60 kilometers out. Yeah, it goes 60 kilometers out, comes back, still comes back to Boston. Okay, you have to get it way out there before it's gonna be taken by the currents, but where's it gonna go? It's gonna go up, go up north. Um, we have such a demand for the ocean, and even in London here, an oceanographer in London is a bit odd, but I should point out, we're equal distance from all the oceans in the world. So I can study anyone I want. And it takes me the same amount of time to get there. So plastics, just city waste, just waste from our lives. Here's direct sewage going into the lake. A relatively freakish picture for me. Sewage swimmer, okay? Somehow I don't think that should be any, you know, a, a photo we should ever be able to get from the web. And then the last part here is a, it's a reminder that as we change the ocean environment, it's starting to resemble our intestines. Now I know this is, you know, it's, it's evening and there's free food and everything and it's not very good, but the point is our intestines are about 3% salt, ocean's about 3% salt. If we put organics in the ocean, the organic level goes up to pretty close to our intestines. So organisms that thrive in our intestines are starting to be able to thrive in the coastal waters. Okay, so the waters that we're relishing and bathing in, you know, snorkeling in, in some cases are starting to be able to harbor the same infectious agents that we're trying to avoid. Okay, so it's a really negative thing. I became an oceanographer because, you know, it's beautiful. And, you know, here's my office. You know, it's a, it's a remarkable opportunity to go out there and see all sorts of things. Is there anything to speak up? I, I can speak up. And will you wave when I get quiet again? Okay. Okay. So, you know, this is, this is what I, I bought into. And this is the ocean that we have. Very disappointing in many ways. But that's all part of the population change. It's all part of how we deal with our wastes. Because the take home message is, what happens in London, Ottawa, anywhere, eventually works its way down to the ocean. It's the last depository. And thus, when we flush the toilet here, the ramifications are, oh, it's gonna, the non-processed wastes are gonna work their way down. Is that better? Oh. Okay. Okay, so in our lab we do a couple things. And I want to talk about these because I want us to show how um, there are other issues other than the oil spill that, we, that should draw some attention. Over the 20 years we've recognized that there are organisms that are now inhabiting our coastal waters that carry toxins that are toxic to fish, marine mammals, and even humans. 20 or so years ago, this was considered a fringe piece of science. Now, it's common throughout the world. Uh, the meeting of the people that studied these things 20 years ago was 100, well, about 100 people in the world. The meeting, which um, one of my students would be going to in a couple weeks, will be 3,000. Okay, really important changes. There are um, coral reef problems. There, you know, this is the, you know, the, the canary in the coal mine. This is, we've lost 50% of coral reefs over the last 50 years. Well, actually less than that, but 50% in 20 years. Do we know why? Not really. Still a mystery, but it's absolutely something that we should be aware of. Uh, one of the other projects we work on is can 
humans, when they run out of land or want a better land, move into the ocean without negative consequences. So we work in Dubai on these large growths. These are human growths into the environment with this uh, one here has about 30,000 inhabitants. And they have water needs, wastewater, recreational needs. Can they move into that environment without totally damaging the coastal environment? And one of the last things is the ocean is always thought to be the last refuge that maybe we can modify the ocean to uh, consume more of the CO2 we're putting in the atmosphere. Okay, can we use the ocean for our um, in industrial waste, uh, uh, accumulating our industrial waste? Okay, um, my take is that it's dangerous to do. It's perhaps wrong and perhaps there's some ethics involved in this, but the point is there are many big problems out there that are continual and worth looking at. So when we get to an oil spill, we're looking at a kind of a blemish, a serious problem in the ocean that for at least a period of time has a big impact in the discussion. But there are other aspects of the ocean that we should be constantly discussing. We should be thinking about the health of the oceans. So let's get back to kind of the, the overall theme for a second. Ecosystem health, there's a, basically there's a, at the top, there's the academic answer. It's really a relationship between the environment and human health. Uh, but the way the school looks at it is basically that if you have a healthy environment, there's a better chance that your community will remain healthy. And if you improve the health of the people, there's a better chance that they're gonna demand that their environment remain healthy. It's a very nice relationship. And the um, need, our, our relationship with oil spills and uh, coastal waters kind of all relate to this as well. <clears throat> okay. I, if you can interpret the first part of every slide, this would be nice. <laughs> Uh, but let's put a perspective on this. We are all here because we want to talk about the Gulf oil spill. We know it gathered a lot of headlines. Now the question is, was it, is it real? Is it just a blemish? Okay, things of all sorts, the headlines changed all over the time, place because, well, where are we getting our information from? We're getting, of course, from BP, which is, well, you know, they're, they're not, uh, uh, they're a bystander to this whole process. So they first report, oh, maybe 1,000, 5,000 barrels a day. Okay, now to me that still sounds like a lot, but no, no that's okay. And the estimates eventually get to be around 25,000 to 30,000 barrels of oil per day coming out of the leaking well. The final NOAA estimates, the National Oceanographic and then Atmospheric Administration, is around 62,000 barrels of oil per day over the three or so month period. Now, they captured some of it, burned it, skimmed it off, but there's still over four million barrels in the, the environment, okay? Pretty substantial, I would say. But is it? Well, let's, you also get this other argument in the, that oil is a natural part of the marine ecosystem. There's always oil in the environment. It's true. Here's the big spills. This is a, on average, you get about 40, 40 million gallons of oil into the ocean every year from oil spills. It's pretty much in the same, um, scale is, is if, you know, how much is just naturally leaking out of seeps in the bottom of the ocean? Or how much is just leaking from everywhere they put a drill bit? Okay, so we're, not, we're dealing with relatively small amounts on the scale here. Of course, the top one is us. Okay, taking oil, putting it on land, putting it in our cars, perhaps disposing it of, you know, 
you know, poorly or industrially poorly. But the water, the oil that we get, the oil that is left on the land eventually works its way into the ocean. So that's in the scale so of, say, six times more. Uh, well, this is actually just, these are gallons into the Gulf of Mexico. But the earlier statistic was That's right. That's right. And of course, uh, you know, just to keep you alive, I'm going to do, do tons later. So, <laughs> we, it's, it's trying to get enough comparative data. Uh, you can always take the present data and convert it, but the, some of the other data is not always convertible, so, okay. So this is, you know, uh, the, on, a relatively, on a relative scale, the amount of drainage from land is much greater than that of, of seepage. But we know that because we use most of the oil on the land, okay, we, you know, um, but it eventually gets there. This is, of course, when often described as the largest oil spill um, that we've recorded. And here it is, tons of crude oil. I told you I get the tons. Okay, tons of crude oil on this spill is 580,000 as an estimate. All right. There's other comparable spills over time. The Ixtoc, the one just above it, is also a Gulf of Mexico spill that occurred in 1979 and 1980. Notice this is a long period of time. I don't know if you remember this spill, but in general, it's offshore. There's very little risk to the coastal environment, so there was very little activity on trying to manage the spill. And thus, it becomes quite a different scenario as to the deep water horizon that threatened the coastal waters. The most famous, at least, you know, in, in my generation and is the Exxon Valdez. Small by comparison, but it's not just the size. It's in a smaller area, a more enclosed area. It's in cold water. There's a variety of reasons that it is perhaps more damaging than anything in the Gulf of Mexico. So we can learn a lot from the Exxon Valdez as well. The Amacoca does. And uh, the Odyssey off of Nova Scotia and the uh, Torrey Canyon, they were all the uh, oil spills that we, that we learned from. Okay, we had not really been prepared for large tankers to crash on shore and see what the effect were. Very much the top three are science experiments and actions, or experiments of opportunity. Okay, what happens if you start scrubbing the rocks with detergent or scrubbing the birds? This is where we learned all the things that are successful and failures here. What is missing, of course, here is, or missing on, on this side, is what causes the problems? These are not natural events, okay? Number one up there, Torrey Canyon, carelessness. Uh, it's, it's a nice word. The ship runs up on a rock. That's pretty careless. Uh, carelessness, a storm associated with a, the navigation of a ship caused problems. Okay. In number, in Amacoca Diz, that's the first time we decided, well, maybe the, having the oil stick around is not a good idea. Maybe we should use detergents to get rid of the oil. Detergents are very controversial, and I'm going to give you a, my, my take on this a little bit, but I think um, perhaps detergents are not the best idea. In the Amoco Cadiz, well, we know it's, yeah, yeah, sorry, in the Exxon Valdez, we know it's also carelessness. We recognize that it's in cold water. We recognize that it was on lots of rocky shores. It was highly visible to the press and that if you got that oil off the shores, you were doing something very positive. So among all these things, for the first time, we might have recognized that by re putting detergents and scrubbing and blasting this oil off the uh, rocks, now, it did look better, but created this human health risk for the workers that were there. Okay. 
something we have to think about. It's not just the oil, it's the cleanup that might be the issue here. Okay, and again, the Ixtoc one, the Gulf of Mexico, it was generally untreated. There was no detergents added. It was allowed to dis, uh, what's the word? Yeah, disappear. Uh, there's a science word in there, but I forgot it. Um, okay, it was a, a, you know, allowed to degrade naturally because there was no real risk. It was just kind of out there. Only 1% ever reached the beaches. Okay, so we have a lot for comparison here. So we can make some conclusions about the Gulf of Mexico spill, uh, which I think are, are fairly realistic because we've had some practice. Um, if you got the headlines from this whole process, you can recognize that, you know, there's the ebb and flow of reporting. Okay, oh, first of all, there was an explosion that caused um, basically the, the oil rig to, to rupture. And then you would get in July, it says, several days of no oil being reported, this is a good thing. And then a couple of days later, you can say, oh, it's breaking up faster than expected. Oh, this is a good thing, you know, oil's there, but it's, it's gone. It's breaking up, it's disappearing. Um, and it says three quarters of the oil are already gone according to the uh, EPA officials. Okay, and then uh, a week later, Nearly 80% of it still stays, according to researchers. Okay, so wait, three quarters are gone, 80, three quarters are there, three quarters are gone, what's, what's the deal? Okay, and again, there's a big difference. As measuring oil in water is complicated because it's not uniform and it's not always in the same spot. It's kind of like measuring something as it's flowing down the river to some extent. You have to understand the mass of, of oil that is there and where it disappears to. So we are getting an enormous amount of different ideas. And then it says, well, this 80% is actually deeper down into the ocean. It's not on the surface. So if you look at the surface, it looks pretty good. But 100 meters below, it's all sitting down there in this kind of oil-rich pod, this glob. Um, well, what, I don't know which one is right. We do know that the glob of oil still exists in the Gulf of Mexico, and it's at 100 meters. And for probably most of you in the, the room here, you're happy for that. It doesn't look bad anymore. For me, 100 meters is where all the biology in the ocean is occurring doesn't really occur at the surface. And if, if I were an oceanographic seabird expert, you know, I'd be happy like you. Huh, nothing's on the surface, this is good. But there's an enormous amount of biology that occurs just below the surface <coughs> of all oceans at about the 100 meter mark where this glob is sitting. And that's gonna be kind of one of the, the take home messages. Of course, today in, in, the, in the newspaper it says, the migrating birds are coming back. This is good news. It must mean that the oil spill is done with. And I, I, I read that and I had to sit down for a while because <laughs> I, I, again, don't know a lot about birds, but I don't think they're reading the papers. <laughs> they may not really know that there was an oil spill that they should be concerned about. They've been <laughs> off feeding in the north for the, the summer. Okay, uh, so th there's an enormous amount of mis, uh, uh, mis I don't want to say misrepresentation, but we're always looking for good news. And by the way, I mean, the, the, the essence, the title, you know, it's one of those things, the headline doesn't quite match the, um, the text, but it's basically saying there's probably enough good ecology and good biology that the birds will be successful when they do migrate down. But that's not what the headline said. Okay, so you recognize that there's, there's also the argument, and you, you may have read it, that, oh, we were so lucky because it wasn't a stormy season. The oil just sat in the Gulf of Mexico and thus all our actions could now, we could, we could actually work at getting rid of that oil. That's both a good and a bad thing, 
all the oil is sitting there, so it is affecting that community. Um, and by treating it, I think we have a, can create a, a very negative impact on that community. So let me get there in a second. Okay, again, that's a couple, couple things we can learn from the Gulf of, uh, from the uh, Exxon Valdez that may be appropriate for the Gulf of Mexico. And it came really from a headline from the Globe that said something along the lines of, uh, Louisianans affected by Gulf oil spill, they seek the information from Alaskans. What did, what did you do, what did you learn that will help us get through this situation? And there's a variety of things here, but basically, the Alaskans with rocky shores, they did all the detergent stuff they wanted. And they sprayed it and they added this kind of famous or infamous detergent called Corexit. I love the name. Okay, put oil out, it puts the detergent in, it corrects it. <laughs> okay, I mean, it's, you know, it's really um, a, a super uh, advertisement for this whole process. Does it make the oil go away? Well, no, it doesn't correct the oil problem, it corrects our perception of the oil problem. And that's something that is concerning to me. And if I put up the right slide, and here I put up the wrong proposal, so let me look at the next one. Ah, oh, I did it. Okay. Okay. We'll talk about Corexit in a second. Okay. Uh, one of the things that the Alaskans learned was the oil remains for decades. All right. We you stop talking about it. You go on with different your life, sometimes in a different way, different types of fisheries, different types of things, but the oil is there. And I'll show you a slide in a little bit that looks at where the oil is after three years of sitting out in the environment after the spill. And it's always surprising to me that 25 years later, they can still account for about 80% of the oil that's spilled. Nah, okay. That's, that's a remarkable amount. Okay, now, um, it, it, most of it doesn't break down. Most of it is still part of the environment. Okay, uh, there's been, let's see, where am I? Uh, substantial long-term modifications of the biology. Now, when, we th when, when you think back to the Exxon Valdez, you probably think back about the, you know, the uh, seagulls, the birds, the organisms that are attempting to get out of that surface slick. The, probably the biggest impact occurred in the larval fish. The young fish, that young of the year, that population that would inhabit that bay for the next generations. Some of those fish never came back. Okay, the herring, they had a big herring industry. It has never come back to that bay. The large animals, the seals, whales, their populations are about 10% what they were prior to the spill. Now, you know, it's 25 years later. There's something about the basic ecology that's been lost so that the new influx of organisms, whales, seals, they don't have the food. They don't have the sus sustainable population levels. And it's a, I think it's quite surprising to biologists. And I think it's not surprising to the people that live there. It's an opportunity for environmental amnesia. I'm, I'm very keen on this word, and you know, nobody else uses it, so you can, you can forget about it on the way out. Um, <laughs> but, you know, we, we, we see what the environment used to be, and then we are allowing it to degenerate and gets less and less and less, and then, you know, we show our kids what the environment is, and they remember it. Instead of being here, it's here, and so they're accepting that, well, you know, we're pretty close to what it used to, what, you know, was when I was a kid, and you work your way down. And in the ocean, especially in coastal waters, environmental amnesia is key. Um, you know, you don't have to go very far to think about the big fisheries, the, the, the large fish that used to be there and no longer there. In general, you know, when it comes to fisheries, We've eaten 
80 to 90 percent of all the big fish already. We're left with only the small fish. So the expectations of the next generations is that, well, the ocean is filled with small fish. It's always been filled with small fish. I remember my, my, you know, my dad and my mom saying, it's filled with small fish. Okay, but, you know, and you don't want to, you know, it's not like, you know, walking home to school two and a half miles uphill both ways. You know, that, you know, my parents always talk to me about, you know, oh, you want to ride? You know, I had to go, you know, 10 miles. It was even snowing in January or snowing in July. You know, you know we're not talking about, you know, an, an inflated memory loss of your parents. Um, we're really talking about a real expectation of what resources that are there. So the expectations for the environment are lower. The value of that resource is lower after 25 years. And trawlers that used to be there are no longer there. There's no memory of them, no remnants. It's a big loss. One of the key findings of this kind of celebratory 25-year study was the fact that interviewing individuals that were cleaning the, soil, or cleaning the oils them. It was very difficult for researchers to find individuals that were part of the cleanup. And uh, analysis done recognized that most of the workers died relatively early in life compared to the rest of the population. As that was smaller news than I thought it should be. But on the other hand, you have to think about it's not just the contamination from cleaning up, which is what it was implied. Their livelihoods are gone. The reason for living, their, you know, their purpose in the community, all sorts of things have changed here. And they're social and environmental, all, all interwoven. But it did say that if you were looking at that community, that community changed. It became younger for the wrong reasons. This is all the messages that were given to Louisianans okay, as their spill was occurring. I think nothing wildly positive here. Okay, so let me get the corrects it. All right, uh, I, you know, we, as oceanographers, we are allowed to carry around corrects it. Uh, I do happen to have some from experiments that were done in 1978. Okay, I, I, I still think it's good. Okay, so here's a glass. Seawater. London tap water with 3% salt. Okay. <laughs> London tap water with 3% salt with two tablespoons of olive oil. Okay. All right. Here's the glass with Corexit. Same amount of oil. Instead of being on the surface here, just spread through the whole thing in small little globules. Tiny little globules, 10, 50 microns. If you look at the surface, you can say, well, look at all that oil up there. This is not good. And you look over here and say, well, there's far less oil sitting on the surface. We're doing something positive. All right. This, there's obviously the same amount of oil in each of the glasses other than the one on the right. Well, so why do we use Corexit? Because it's not getting rid of the oil, it's just distributing it differently. Uh, I'm gonna show you in a minute, or I'm gonna try to convince you in a minute that it's distributing it so that it becomes more, actually more toxic to organisms. But as a, a colleague of mine in, in New York has stated in, in, the, in the press, allowing BP or Exxon or any of these companies to be responsible for oil cleanup of their spills is like the police department inviting the murderer to come in and clean up the murder scene, okay? It's so easy for them to take some detergent and put it out there and say, hey, the concentration of the oil is lower on the far right-hand side than it is here because it's distributed through a larger amount of water. Okay? So my thoughts is, now let's see. If we have oil up here, we have some sort of strategies to perhaps remove it from the environment. If 
we have oil over here, we don't have any strategies anymore. A combination of detergent and oil is more damaging to the ecosystem than oil sitting on the surface that just freaks out humans. Okay? This combination has no, we have no ability to remove it from the environment. Here, there's a couple other strategies. Personally, I don't think it should be allowed. Personally, I think if it's sitting on the surface, we should try to get it off of the surface. If it's sitting on rocks, perhaps it's best to keep them on the rocks. And if it's on a bird, well, this is where I get in trouble. I won't tell you, but the, you know, <laughs> we, it was a question that the last time I gave this lecture from a, a member of the audience, well, you know, isn't it good to take all the oil off the birds? And I think, you know, it is good. It makes you feel good. It makes that one bird feel good, et cetera. But then where do you put it? You, can't, you know, you can't put it out. You have to have some sort of ability to um, move the bird to an environment that is not oil rich any longer, that has a chance for that bird to survive. Even, even cleaning a bird is controversial in, in some ways. Okay, uh, there we go. So here are the strategies for cleaning it up. You can skim it off as much as possible and burn it. Okay, you know, there's all sorts of negative, you can think, that, oh, it's all going to the atmosphere. It's oil, it's all going to go into the atmosphere anyways. You know, just, you know, you're circumventing putting it through your car. Okay, so not a bad idea. Detergents and scrubbing, uh, or dispersants such as Corexit, it makes us feel that we're doing something, okay? And that there's sort of certain value to that. But it makes these globules that are very toxic, very um, worrisome in the environment. Sometimes you, if it's stable, you can put solve, uh, sorbents out there like big diapers, okay? And you float them out there. They're more absorbent to um, oils than they are to to seawater, and they can pick up a lot. Eventually, you have to bring them in, uh, ashore and do something with them, but at least it's out of the environment that is out of uh, your control. And bioremediation, oil-eating bacteria, natural or enhanced. Well, I have, uh, with respect to my, my colleague over here, I have some concerns about this. Okay, and you'll see that there are oil-eating bacteria. It's not surprising. We already showed you that there's a lot of oil in the ocean naturally. But there's consequences of a bacteria eating the oil. It does break it down. Does it break it down to smaller, more toxic compounds? Does it break it down and, my worry, consume oxygen in the process of doing this? So I don't think this is kind of an, an interesting task, but it shouldn't be done at sea, it should be done on land, where you can control the process. Okay, so here's a figure of where the oil goes. In the, I think it's a green box at the top, it's all the oil that sits on the surface and has a chance to be removed and absorbed from the surface. The minute it gets stormy, or you add dispersants, it moves from the surface of the water into the red box, into the deeper parts of the ocean. Most of the ocean biology does not occur right at the surface. It occurs in the sediments, coastal waters, or deeper down, away from the UV, away from the mixing depth where things are a little more stable. If you allow the oil to stay at the surface, you have a chance to remove it. If you mix it using Corexit or detergent, in dispersion into the deeper waters, it has a much higher chance to get into the, the food chain. And that's my criteria of success. If the food chain is stable, if the organisms that lead us to fish, etc., are stable, then we've done a pretty good job at removing the risks. If we've contaminated the food chain by getting rid of it so we can't we don't have to worry about it or see it, then um, we've, we've really failed. So corrects it, and most of these other processes, since shouldn't have been used, in my, in my view, shouldn't have been used, because it was stable, it wasn't stormy, 
it wasn't going to be mixed up. Why don't you take the opportunity to try to skim it off of the system? Here's uh, the that Exxon Valdez thing, and this is for the chemists in the audience. Um, and you should recognize that it tells you on this axis how much oil, just everything is being organized at number one. And then 1,000 days later, okay, the recovered material is this mountain here. Okay. The rest, eh, it's distributed in the water column, it's up in rocks, there's a variety of places that it has been. But in general, very little of it had left after three years. And as we say, 25 years later, basically it's been stable for 25 years. The oil that is there is recalcitrant. It's not breaking down any longer. This is just an easier way to look at it. For those that don't like graphs, a table, total amount after one day, 180% three years later. All right, it's a legacy. It changes things. It's part of the ecology now. Now, there will be a quiz on this, okay? <laughs> I always find, I, and I warned you, okay, that this will be the most important thing to look at. But this is like first year biology food chain. Now, you don't have to recognize anything other than there are things you eat, they tend to be on the upper part, the trophic different parts of the trophic parts. The tuna, I maybe don't eat large squid, but some people do. They're a benthic fish. And then there's this part here. This is the start of the food chain, the photosynthetic organisms. Small, and they move the energy through the, to the things that people like to either eat or cuddle. <laughs> no one likes to cuddle a phytoplankton. You can't figure that out. Now, just to make sure phytoplankton are just small photosynthetic organisms, say 20, 30 microns. And if you have to think of them as tiny little trees, you may do so, but don't put that on the exam because it bothers me. They're, they're not trees. They're small little cells. They're like, like, um, like photosynthetic yeah, yogurt cells. Okay. But being photosynthetic, they start the energy moving through here. So the energy that moves through this food chain is driven by light and nutrients. Yeah, and not by carbon, and that's going to be the difference. Now, a lot of people don't like looking at this because they only would look up at the, the, the beautiful little porpoise up there. Okay, so let me just get rid of the, the, the cuddly part of this diagram and show you this simple diagram. Okay, as simple as possible, these are the smallest organisms, and you jump up several orders of magnitude with each box. So if you have to, visualize the porpoise at the far right and the phytoplankton in this section here. And one organism we haven't talked about are bacteria. Now we know bacteria, they consume organics. They break down waste. And there's lots in the, in the ocean. And they tend to be, well, they're valuable in the ocean as well. Those little stars up there, and of course they're supposed to be yellow because they're supposed to be the sun but yeah, everything's yellow. Um, <laughs> they represent where energy comes into the ecosystem. And this is your kind of your oceanographic lecture. Energy comes in and it flows along. These cells getting photosynthesizing and they're eaten by the next group, eaten by the next group. So in general, you eat something that is one tenth your size and eventually you get to a big organism. So the normal food chain in the Gulf of Mexico or in the coastal waters looks something like this. Large phytoplankton are eaten by shrimp or small zooplankton, small fish, bigger fish. Okay, and, and, you know, there's all sorts of complexities to this, but you know, I think for our first lecture, we're doing pretty good. All right, so what happens if you don't rely on sunlight anymore? Okay, now there's a couple steps I wanna go through this, but first of all, not every organism is susceptible or damaged by oil in the same fashion. Larger fish can avoid the oil, can avoid eating or uh, oil-contaminated organisms, et cetera. 
it's these small organisms here, the ones with the red excess, that can't avoid it and that are very sensitive to the small concentrations of oil. They won't thrive, they won't survive. So what happens is the base of the food chain is lost. Now, if, if, if you work your way, the big fish can eat the little fish for a while, and the little fish can eat the, the shrimp for a while, but the shrimp's food is now lost. That part of the food chain, if oil is still mixed through the system, is lost for a period of time. Many of these things will eventually come back, but for a period of time, they're lost. All the carbon is coming in, not through sunlight anymore, but through the oil here, and it stimulates the bacteria. The bacteria and some of the algae get stimulated as well. And a predatory invasive species comes in, one species that doesn't filter out organisms. They can eat the, you know, the, the small bacteria, they can eat all sorts of things. That's the famous jellyfish. So I don't know if any of you ever head to Florida, but you can recognize in Florida there's been relatively massive evidence of jellyfish for the last 10 or so years. Has anybody noticed it or you know this story at all? Well, jellyfish are starting to replace natural fish. They're competitors. So if we give them lots of bacteria, lots of small algae, no competitors over there, nothing for them to eat, we get an enormous jellyfish outbreak. And it's not happened in the Gulf of Mexico, but it's happened in many places around the world that have bacteria-generated food chains. Okay, lots of sewage into the system. Bacteria consume lots of oxygen. They're, they're heterotrophs. They, they, they suck the oxygen out of the water. So we're dealing perhaps with a, a, a zone here that not only has oil, but has lower and lower amounts of oxygen in the water. That whole food chain on the other side is driven by organisms that have always evolved in an oxygen-rich environment. They are, like us, dependent on oxygen. So if it's a stagnant system with the oil at depth, I'm anticipating that you're going to have, over the next few months, some real stresses for oxygen in that environment. Not positive news. But you have to remember, the Gulf's large. When this eventually dissipates, the food chain will collapse back into being something more natural, perhaps. Perhaps. Uh, well, I don't know. I don't know, if you're, if you're really interested in this, um, this is kind of an ecologist view of whether you can bring an ecosystem back or not. And this is a concern that everyone is having. If you have an ecosystem, it might be nice and stable and we can you know, cause some sort of damage between it. But if you really push an ecosystem or damaging, it moves to a different level, a different respon uh, response, a different expectation. And to get the new eco ecology back to the old ecology, it's not that easy. Just like the Gulf of, or the Exxon Valdez, where the ecology never came back, the ecology has settled into a different type of ecology than they had before. Ecologists worry about this for the Gulf of Mexico. It may not be the same big problem, but that's the most theoretically challenging aspect here. Will the old ecology ever come back? And no one knows the answer. Okay, uh, okay so anyways, we already talked about the plume here. The plume is not tiny here. This is that, that the oil slick deep into the water. Uh, they have it at 3,000 feet deep. Uh, again, almost 20 miles long, etc. Oil, at least in that spot, is still there. All right. Now, here's my, well, the next point, and that is maybe this is probably one of the worst spots to ever have an oil spill. Okay, it's not a pristine environment. It's not an environment that hasn't already been beaten up a little bit by us. We have, over the last 20, 30 years, modified our 
needs on the earth have substantially. We have lots of new nutrients being generated to give us more food as the population has changed. So this is just an example here saying how much new nitrogen is coming into the environment since 1960. Now nitrogen eventually makes it all the way to the oceans and it causes those phytoplankton, those little beautiful little tiny trees to grow like crazy. That's this eutrophication, this the algae, the scum that's forming on, on um, the, the coastal waters. And, and, and Ontario lakes as well. I mean, it's, it's all over the place. For those of you, none of you look old enough to remember the 60s and the 70s, when Lake Erie kind of went to this ugly green color. Nobody remembers? No, you're way too young for that. But the point, <laughs> the point simply is, we, before we did wastewater treatment, well, all our waste, nitrogen and phosphorus, all went into the lakes. And that stimulated the growth of the algae. And that caused the decline of the quality of life of Lake Erie, most of the Great Lakes. We eventually smartened up and said, well, if we remove all the phosphate from our sewage treatment, from our sewage, and put that into the lake, it'll be fine, and it'll be clear, et cetera. It's true. We allowed the nitrogen to go through because freshwater species don't need that much nitrogen compared to the phosphorus. And that goes into the ocean. And the oceanic species all need nitrogen. They don't care much about phosphorus. So our legacy of wastewater treatment and learning from the lakes has made sure that we're enhancing the ecology of the coastal waters. We've also kind of denuded land and done a variety of other things that make sure that nitrogen quickly escapes from the land into the, the ocean. And there's no place better than, to show this than the Gulf of Mexico. Because the Gulf of Mexico, of course, has that beautiful Mississippi River. It's got an enormous catchment running from southern Alberta all the way down to Louisiana. And as it goes through there, our policies and our land means that it accumulates materials and dumps it immediately into the Gulf of Mexico, right where the spill is. So for decades, well, not decades, but it's two decades, we've been enhancing and changing the ecology of the lakes, of the, the Gulf of Mexico, by putting stuff in our lands, in our wastewater, so that it accumulates down here. Now all the sexy stuff is gone here, but it's in the range of 10 million pounds of pesticides enter the Gulf of Mexico from the Mississippi every year. Okay, I can't remember it. I think it's 60 billion pounds of, um, these numbers do matter, so let me see here. Oh, yeah, see? I, not honest here, six billion pounds of fertilizer. <laughs> okay. okay, I was getting carried away. Um, but the point simply is, that's a, that's a lot of fertilizer, that's a lot of pesticides through the system, every year, into that one area. And 120 billion gallons of animal waste. All right, that seems like a substantial number. And 65 million people use this as their drinking water. All right, now I, this, again, this freaks me out a little bit. Let's see, 120 billion gallons of animal waste and it's somebody's drinking water, okay? Now they're allowed to filter it and process it before they drink it, and it goes back in and it gets cycled through the whole process, okay? But still, we, we need that water. But the water, by the time it gets to the Gulf of Mexico, is adding a great environmental insult already. Most of it organic. Most of it adding material that bacteria can chew up. And then chewing up consumes the oxygen. So already, the Gulf of Mexico has this long zone of hypoxia, low levels of oxygen in the environment. It's at the sediments. When it's at the sediments, Fish have problems reproducing. You know, the shellfish, the, the benthic organisms can't survive very well. So we already have that position, and now we're adding 580,000 tons of oil that adds oxygen 
depletion pressure into that same area. So I think it's got a double whammy. I don't think it's not, you know, I think oxygen will be the next discussion point. Not toxicity by oil, but we've added an enormous pressure onto the Gulf of Mexico. Okay, this is just a diagram to point out that bacteria do all the work. They consume the oil, they consume the sewage, they consume everything, and when they're under, underwater, they consume oxygen, and getting the oxygen from the atmosphere into the lake is a slow, or into the ocean is a slow process. This occurs here, it occurs in many places across the world, and it's got a big oxygen depleted area off the coast of Oregon and Washington State for reasons that we don't know as oceanographers. The ocean has always been part of our global lungs. We've always relied on the oceans to both provide oxygen to us. But at least in many areas, or in, in many areas, and certainly in the Gulf of Mexico, it no longer can provide that basic function for this whole system of life. So again, summation, sewage, nutrients, and oil going to change that food chain. How dramatically it changes and how fast it recovers, no one knows. The ramifications or the, the understanding from the Gulf of uh, or the Exxon Valdez suggests that it could be some time. And not everything will be coming back. It will be changed. In many places where just sewage and nutrients are sufficiently supplying to the coastal environment, the fish population is gone. So fishermen going out with their nets no longer catch fish, they catch jellyfish, the new food chain. As beautiful as jellyfish are, it is not anything that humans wish from their environment. Uh, if you were an undergrad class, I'd make some joke about peanut butter and jellyfish sandwiches, but uh, I'll not insult you with that one. Um, but, okay, this is a concern, again, um, it gets, well, uh, it gets us to, to think about the ramifications and perhaps the long-term changes that will occur. Now, of course, this is one well, and this is where I want us to think about the value of deep or offshore um, drilling. These are the, you know, a representation of where the wells are in the Gulf of Mexico. All right, and I should point out this as, I kept it up here, it says, the governor of Florida suggests, well, we might as well lift the band, okay, let's let the oil continue to flow, but notice where Florida is and where the oil wells are, okay? <laughs> I, I, I don't think the governor of Louisiana is going to stand up there and say, you know, let's lift the ban. Okay. There are 4,000 oil rigs. Okay. That's just 4,000. Right? To me, that's substantial. The good news is that there's more than one pipe per oil rig. There's 6,000 wells, 4,000 oil rigs. All right. Something's bound to happen. We just noticed that the carelessness was the major theme on bringing, bringing spill oil into the environment. Certainly, BP has been accused of the carelessness in this, this fashion. So the good news is, wow, that means there's 3,999 that are functioning well. It's only one problem. Okay, so the other news is the amount of oil that these 4,000 rigs generate, as far as the needs of the United States is, is less than two days. All right. Are we willing to trade off the health of this environment for two days worth of oil? I don't know. In the, in the CBC today, they're talking about a, a lake in British Columbia. They're, they're, you know, there's a mining, a mine wants to come in there and they want to, perhaps take over the lake, and the, the val what's the value of that lake if the community now has a reason to thrive and uh, you know, bring new jobs in? 
we're only going to lose one lake. We have lots of other lakes in British Columbia. If you want to go see those, those are the best things. Here it's a little different. We don't have lots of coastal environments, not of this scale. So I guess perhaps the, the final thing I want to leave here is that is the risk worth the value? Or are there better ways to deal with this? I, I had the pleasure of talking to the environmental sustainability class today. It's a program at Western, a graduate program for people that have already obviously got a degree in some other faction. And they are looking for novel ways to bring society or bring answers to our environmental problems. It was very interesting. We talked a little bit about the oceans today. And I gave them this task. You know, how do you solve the oil spill problem? How do you solve this eutrophication or the change in the environment? And it was very clear to them, I think, that you don't look at the ocean to solve the problem. You turn around and you look at the land. You look at the people all along those, the Mississippi, how we make decisions on how much can go into the environment, how much that river can hold, what the capacity of this environment really is. But it's not a science question anymore. It's a question about choices. And Canadians have this choice as well. Perhaps it's, you know, I'm not talking as a scientist. Just want to make sure you bring it up. What happens if a spill like this occurs in the north? Well, I don't, I have ideas, but should we allow it? What's the value of the north? What's the value of those northern oil? We already know how we value lakes and rivers in Alberta. Are we to apply the same rules to the north? Now, what's the chances of having skimmers up there? What's the chances of having this material ever removed by heat, by evaporation, by light? I'd say it's an enormous risk. <coughs> Let's get that. OK, last thing. OK, really, we've learned that, among other things, cleaning it up only makes us feel better. And in fact, there may be a health risk associated with cleaning it up. Certainly, there's a risk of it getting into the food chain and making big changes. The oil, regardless of how we feel we're doing, is going to remain for a long time. Now, it may not remain in the Gulf. It may go all the way across Florida, off the Gulf Stream. But it's in the environment. There was a substantial modification of that whole ecology that has lasted for decades in, the Gulf, in, the, in Alaska. The warmer temperatures of the Gulf of Mexico may, may mean it doesn't last that long. Or maybe it means it lasts longer. No one knows. OK. My favorite thing, environmental amnesia. I bet you forgot about it already, but no. OK. The livelihood of the community, the relationship they have with that environment will be lost. And it may be lost forever, and we'll never remember that it existed. Or it may only be lost for a period of time. But this is a key thing. We have to remember what the relationship used to be. And again, we need a really honest criteria of success. Okay, we can't ask BP, go out and measure how much iron, uh, how much iron, sorry, how much oil is there, and uh, tell us how you're doing. Huh, we're doing pretty good. <laughs> we had a correction and the numbers, you know, we, it all disappeared. Okay, not a good strategy. We need, whether it's the US or Canada, whether they're valuable to us, whether that's the type of ocean we want to have for our future and for our future generations. So with that, I really appreciate you coming out tonight. So thank you.